Uh, but I'm gonna give uh, uh, some updates uh, on the investigation. But let me start off by saying to the community, thank you for the continued prayers for our injured officers. It is, uh, it, like I said, Friday, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. It is so heartening for me as a police chief in America's fourth largest city. Uh, like I said, Monday night, uh, the night that we had this incident, that the love affair between the police department and the community, uh, the relationship with our activists, sometimes they're hotter than others, but by and large, they're really good. This is Houston, Texas. We showed the world what we're about during Harvey. We showed the world what we're about uh, time and again, day after day. And I would tell the community, thank you for once again uh, lifting us up. Uh, I'm a person of faith, and I believe that uh, God answers prayers, and we're a prayerful community, and I've got some great news on our uh, injured and wounded officers. Uh, the officer uh, with the wounded injury, a wounded knee or injured knee who had surgery remains hospitalized. He should be leaving pretty soon, uh, but he's in good condition. And when I think that that's a, uh, a real blessing, and I'm happy to report that. One of our officers that was actually the case agent in this case that was uh, listed critical, critical condition, as you all recall, uh, he has been upgraded to fair condition, which uh, God is good. And again, I think, uh, like I said before, uh, we really appreciate the prayers of our community and they're being answered. Uh, the third officer that you all know, the family doesn't want us to get too specific, but let me just say this. We, uh, from where we started to where we are today, uh, prayers for all three officers are being answered. And we just hope and pray uh, and ask for the community's continued prayers. And again, I want to thank the community. Uh, I've spoke to uh, Mr. Uh, Tuttle's brother a little while ago. Uh, as you know, suspect, he's one of our suspects that was uh, tragically killed in this incident. Uh, he's actually uh, called me. Uh, left me a message and I called them back as soon as I came back from a haircut that I desperately needed. Uh, but uh, to the Thuddle family, like I said, Tuesday, uh, I didn't even know their, the names of the suspect on Monday because we had I had to leave that scene to get to the hospital to be with our officers and their families. Uh, did not find out the name of the suspects until Tuesday when I got my update. And as you all know, it's been a pretty, uh, pre pre pretty challenging week with a lot going on. But I got to speak with uh, Mr. Tuttle, who lives in Austin, and uh, that conversation, I was able to express my condolences to the, to the family, because like I said on Tuesday at the hospital, uh, regardless of what led up to the officer-involved shooting, regardless of, uh, and I've always said this, it, it, you could have the, the worst, uh, you know, gang member on the planet, murderer, it's, that's still somebody's child. And I think if you all remember, I talked about that Tuesday morning, but it, uh, it was really good to uh, connect with him. And he's been in Austin since 1987, and uh, I think he remembers me as his chief for almost 10 years uh, there. What I told him is that uh, uh, to, to remember me as the police chief there, uh, to what I stood for, that, su that uh, an accountability, which means accountability for suspects, accountability for officers, and we just uh, seek the truth. And at the end of the day, I made a promise to him, like I've always done for my officers and everyone when we use, uh, when we have these deadly encounters, to uh, seek the truth. I uh, was just talking to my team, and like I told them, uh, we, uh, because there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there and people are going, you know, running rampant. Let me just say this. We never run away from the truth. I've never ran away from the truth as a police chief, as a police leader, and I never will run away from the truth. Regardless of what that truth is, at the end, when we finish a, these comprehensive investigations, our number one goal is always to find out the good, the bad, the ugly, and to be transparent, which is why we uh, tweeted out the uh, affidavit last night in the interest of transparency, because that's what builds community trust. And you know, we always talk about relational policing, which uh, talks about uh, what we want to do to uh, build that relationship that in Houston, uh, and I, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure, so all of a sudden you're a member of the media, you're here, Ashton's here, one of our activists that he has his ups and downs with us sometimes, but I think you know that that's 
that's my style, and I'm not going to run with if we can get to the truth and leave them still on a turn. So uh, it felt good to talk to him uh, and to talk to him so he can talk to the rest of the family. And uh, and he, he says, hey, Chief, all we want is just to, uh, you know, it's hard to understand. But like I told him, you know, uh, for those that think, hey, his brother didn't have a criminal history. Well, neither did the man that killed Dr. Hunsacker, uh, that uh, Hosconnect, excuse me, uh, Dr. Hosconnect, as you all recall. You know, the human human mind is is fragile. We know we have a lot of challenges in society. So uh, what I asked for him that he committed to is keep an open mind. Don't take anything I say uh, as a hundred percent. But keep an open mind. Let us finish our investigation. I also told him uh, some of the things uh, as a brother, what we found so far, because uh, he needs to put that out to his family, and we made that commitment. So uh, that felt, uh, like I said, that was a, a really good. Let me just tell you where we're at with our investigation. Our investigation continues. Uh, I'm going to give, provide you a little uh, detail of what we've uncovered so far as to how we ended up at uh, 7815 Harding uh, and uh, I think uh, I might have said Hardy at some point and like I told because he actually brought it up I said, I, and I said Mr. Tuttle uh, uh, Monday night was a tough night for the city of Houston it was a tough night for our community they heard about five of their beloved police officers that had been shot it was a tough night for a neighborhood that had this uh, big uh, shootout uh, and it, and uh, Hardy Tollway Harding but I promise you that as you saw on the the affidavit that we were at the right house based on our investigation to that to that uh, point uh, so I will give you a brief overview of how we got to that point and then we'll take it from there on January 8th uh, 2019 uh, patrol officers in the East uh, East Side Division of the uh, Houston uh, Police Department received uh, and a call and were dispatched for service at 7815 Harding regarding a suspicious person. The caller wanted to remain anonymous, but stated her daughter was inside the residence, quote, doing drugs, and they have a lot of guns in the residence. She stated there was also a female in the house, uh, and I'm not gonna say the name, uh, because again, it's part of the investigation and we wanna keep this investigation tight. The caller stated she was at the residence, looking through the windows of the residence, <coughs> but wanted again to stay anonymous. The call slip list multiple times at the caller phone and the dispatch repeating her complaint that her daughter was in the residence and there were guns and heroin. Officers arrived on the 8th of uh, January at about 2017. Uh, PM. Officers parked in the street in front of the residence, just east of the driveway. Officers did not observe anyone outside the residence. Officers walked in the street, back and forth in front of the house, and to see if this complainant would flag them down, and that did not occur. A female was walking down the street while talking on a phone. Officers asked her if she had called the police. She explained that she did not. Uh, then into the phone, she stated she was on the she was we were right in front of that house in 815 she stated to whoever she was talking to hey the police are at the dope house uh, uh, the officers uh, called the anonymous caller on the phone number listed in the call slip she stated she did not want to give any, inf any information because they were drug dealers and they would kill her she wanted the officer to go into the house and get her daughter uh, one of the officers explained that the officers really cannot go into the house at that time, this is the patrol officers. The officer wrote a detailed note within the call slip history to document their actions, what they had learned, and what they had done. Officer Mer I almost said the name, I'm not going to say it right now because I don't want him uh, in inundated until this is all done. The officers uh, then contacted Lieutenant Todd, which you all know from our narcotics division, who does a, does a phenomenal job uh, in terms of some of the work they've been doing up there. And the lieutenant, uh, provides a copy of the information and the notes prepared by the patrol officers to our case agent in this case, which is the individual that it has been shot. Like I said, this is his third time being shot in the line of duty and told him <coughs> uh, to start working, to start working the location. Like I said, the night of this incident, our greatest force multiplier is the people we serve. And the reason that uh, we are as effective as we are in this big city with such an under-resourced police department is twofold. One, we have 
uh, a great police department with the majority of our people are hardworking, honorable, phenomenal, committed, and like I like to brag on them, they don't make excuses, they make a difference. We are a department of 5,200 police officers in a city of 640 square miles. Contrast that to Chicago with about 278 miles and close to 13,000 police officers. Uh, the reason that we can reduce crime once again by over 10% in 2018 is we enjoy a phenomenal relationship with our community, including our activist community. Uh, it's just, this is not, this is Houston, and we'll talk about that later uh, in a little bit. But we just have great community support and mutual respect. And again, it was the 911 call that began this, and we started our investigation. So on January, again, this happened on, the first call was on January 11th when we responded. Patrol provides the information to uh, the lieutenant and narcotics, and narcotics lieutenant three days later uh, initiates, uh, orders the initiation of an investigation. On January 27th, uh, the case agent uh, utilized a confidential informant to make a controlled buy at the residence. Uh, you've all read the affidavit that led to that, that uh, details uh, that controlled by, so I'm not going to reiterate it. I know that one of the outstanding questions uh, by uh, the community and by the media is, has that uh, substance been tested? And the answer is yes. Uh, and it came back uh, as uh, heroin. It has been confirmed to be heroin. I'm sorry, what? No, sir, go ahead. Okay, uh, has been confirmed to be heroin. Uh, by the Houston Forensic Science Center, which is uh, uh, which is located uh, above. Uh, so, the search warrant was obtained, uh, and we all know that on uh, January 28th, uh, uh, the off the case agent presented a search warrant with an affidavit for the residence uh, to Harris County Magistrate Gordon C. Markham II, the presided, presiding judge of Houston Municipal Court Number 13. He signed the warrant and, uh, at about 1337, and a ca tactical plan was put together. Uh, and uh, uh, we know, we already know that we had that uh, execution of the search warrant. Uh, in the day, on the night of the incident in the search warrant, investigators did find uh, so, uh, small amounts of uh, what we now have confirmed through tests of marijuana and also of cocaine in the residence from that day and we also recovered the firearms that I uh, previously uh, reported on. It's important because one of the things that a lot of people are asking is, hey, how about these dynamic search warrants? You know, where are the pros and cons? Uh, do we, you know, are they dangerous? And the answer is, anytime you enter a home, whether it's a dynamic or not, it's dangerous. I mean, there's no getting around that. Police work is dangerous. Uh, and uh, which begs the question that I think that is important for the community, our community, because see, we're talking about Houston police. We're talking about Houston, Texas. We're talking about the Houston Narcotics Division. We're not talking about, we're talking about our activists in Houston. We're talking about our relationship in Houston. We're interested in what's happening in our city. And I, so I thought it was important for us to take a quick look at uh, our numbers uh, on this in, uh, in terms of what, what has been the total number and this is preliminary, so I want to I make sure that we double check the numbers. So don't hold me. I'm telling you right now, it's preliminary, but that is, uh, we've already done a quick search of our data. And I asked the question because I think that that's a question that's out there to the community. Hey, are they dangerous? Answer, yes. Any type of execution of a search warrant is dangerous. And it's dangerous here, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. That's just, that's just a fact. Uh, but... It's important for people to know that the data that we collected at my direction uh, was from a period of January 1st, 2014 through December 31st of 2018. I asked uh, my folks to find out for me how many search warrants has the narcotics division executed between January 1st, 2014 and December 31st, 2018. And out of those total warrants, how many, remember, we're not counting 2019, so I want you guys, reporters, to get it right. We're talking up to the end of the year. 
uh, of 2018, how many officer-involved shootings where we got engaged, either sh shot at a human being, discharged at a, at a person. So in that time, between 1-1 of 14 and December 31st of 2018, the Narcotics Division executed 1,736 search warrants. That's 1,736 search warrants. At, uh, as a result of those, during those search warrants, we had experienced one officer-involved shooting in a five-year period with 1,736 search warrants. Ironically, on Monday, a day full of irony, we had been talking with the mayor and I, Mayor Turner and I had been talking to this community reporting on violent crime and overall crime at the Houston Police Academy. If you re remember, it was a day of irony. We, we, we announced the Tillman Fertitta uh, tactical uh, village that uh, we broke ground on, which will be a huge, huge, huge investment of the community. Again, a community that loves its police department as much as the police department and the people that we that serve in this department love the community. They've invested over $10 million of privately uh, uh, raised funds to build this tactical village that I will tell you when it's done at the end of the year, of, of this year, uh, our training is going to go from great to greater. Uh, and I think it's going to enhance the safety of the men and women that we lead in the community that we serve. Then we went and we talked about crime, if you recall that day, and I said that the, th the three things that, were dri that drive violent crime, uh, and murder specifically, were gangs, domestic violence, and do you remember the third, everybody? The drugs and the drugs. So when you're dealing with uh, drug houses, when you're dealing with uh, uh, narcotics dealing, uh, drugs and guns seem to come together, and those are the three drivers of murder. So that was a very ironic, ironic day. But I think it's very telling as to the training of the Houston Police Department Narcotics Division, the professionalism of the Houston P Police Department Narcotics Division, and the constraint of the Houston Pol the Police Department Narcotics Division. When we look at our data, and again, it's preliminary, but we'll, we'll take a deeper dive. When you look at five years worth of search warrants being executed for a total of 1,736 search warrants, and you have one officer involved shooting in, against a human being. I don't think that that's indicative of a police department that is not doing some great work. If anybody wants to do the math, I already did it, that equates to 0.057%. Or you can say 0.06%. I think that's important for the community to know. Where do we go from here? Uh, we will continue our joint investigation with the district attorney's office, uh, our special investigations unit that everybody that lives in the city knows we started in 2016 on November 30th, 2016, when I uh, got sworn in after being selected by Mayor Turner and confirmed by the city council. One of the first things that I did was take away uh, the responsibility of investigating officer involved shooting from homicide because we want homicide to focus on getting people that are out here committing murders, and we wanted to get uh, and train folks to investigate officers and officers' use of force and other allegations or uh, crimes being committed by police officers. And if you talk to Kim Og, our district attorney, she's going to tell you, uh, she considers that to be the model that she absolutely believes in. She loves the work they're doing, and I think it's a testament to Chief Dobbins, who's standing here, and, uh, and his leadership and the leadership of uh, Chief Slinkard and, and Chief Finner and all of these folks, the work they're doing. They will continue the criminal investigation into uh, the the uh, officer involved shooting and by the way one of the things that I've told them is I want to know every I want them to investigate everything that went into <clears throat> the development of the case uh, the purchase of the drugs of the what we now know to be heroin by the uh, CI and the uh, uh, submission of the affidavit approval of the affidavit and the uh, execution of the search warrant is everybody clear on that and that will be SIU with the uh, assistance and uh, supervision to an extent of the Harris County Civil Ro District Attorney's Office of Civil Rights Division. Concurrently to that, we will have an investigation by the uh, Houston Police Department uh, Internal Affairs Division 
that will conduct an administrative inquiry into uh, all the actions to make sure that all of our policies, procedures, uh, and the training protocols are met. Uh, let me just say this. Uh, just because we're investigated doesn't mean we're going to find anything wrong. And just because we haven't found anything wrong at this point doesn't mean we're going to not end up at the end. It's a very, it's a very extensive, long process. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I told uh, Mr. Tuttle, we've taken the lives of two people and we have to conduct extensive investigation. It's just what we do. It's, you know, it's the nature of our business. And so when we're done with that, we'll be able to report back uh, to the community. Any questions, that, anything that I left out up to this point from anybody? Okay, let me drink a little water because you all know. I'm old. <clears throat> Can you just address the question about the other you know, the lives of you two days and, you know, party and, and obviously the, the warrant says differently and, and all, all these the, the warrant says what? There's... I don't know if you're aware, but there's a gentleman who's been on YouTube a lot. Look, uh, listen, uh, you're talking about conspiracy theories. We don't deal with, we deal with facts at the Houston Police I, Department. I so my, my question to you is, uh, what do you say to members of the community? So there are some out there who are tending to believe that. You know, they're like, we yeah, can't, yeah, they're I, calling you, us. They're you know what? There's people, there's people that believe the earth is flat. I can't control what they think. What I can control is the quality of my investigation. What I can control is how extensive our investigation is, and what I can control at the back end is being transparent so people can decide for themselves. I can tell you we've already pulled body-worn camera from the initial contact from patrol. We don't leave any stone unturned, and if you know anything about me as, a, as an investigator, as a leader, I'm a dog at SOB. I'd leave no stone unturned. And then, uh, quite frankly, I think that, uh, you know, uh, probably some of the some of the consternation might be more less to do with the actions of our narcotics division and more to do with some of the uh, comments that were uh, somewhat over the top uh, by uh, Joe Gamaldi uh, because we've had you know we used to average 45 officer involved shootings or more in this in this city and we're down to about 15 a year and you know it because you believed it so we're, we're doing all the right things in this city, in this department, and including with our relational policing and our partnership with the community. Uh, but I'm not sure because I've been here now for two years and this is the first time that we have this brouhaha and I, quite frankly, I think a big part of it is because uh, Mr. G you know, uh, Joe Gamaldi's emotions got the best of him and started, uh, just went off a little bit over the top, over there, not a lot over the top if you ask me. Which brings me to this. Uh, Joe Gamali doesn't run the Houston Police Department. I do. I'm the police chief, and I'm responsible for everything that goes on in the department. Everything that's good, everything that's bad, and everything that's ugly, and everything that's beautiful. The men and women you see before you here are, are, are the highest levels of this police department. There's only one missing, and back she, she's moving. And the reason she's moving is because uh, her house flooded during Harvey, and she never left this building and this community, and her and her husband uh, are moving into a new home because that's the level of commitment we have. But I want to start off this last portion of this press conference by making it really clear. A relationship between a police department and the community, including our activists, because you know you went a little bit over the top the other day. I think if I think you would say that, uh, we'll, we'll debate it later. You and I will talk about it later, uh, and I'm not saying your name, but we'll talk about it later. But we have done a lot of great work here, and I'll be real honest with you: the HPLU has done a lot of great work here in terms of community building. I mean, they're a really good union. Uh, his emotions were afraid that night, and I don't know, I even watched what he said after, but I want to make something really clear. I'm the police chief hmm. that was appointed by Sylvester Turner to be the chief of this city. And the people that lead this department and lead the department second to none is the men and women you see up here, the commanders that are out right now, the 44 commanders are out there right now doing their job, the lieutenants, the sergeants, and like I said earlier, ultimately the officers. That quite frankly, the very vast majority don't need much guidance because they're damn good. And I think that you all know that. You see them. You see them during when we've had protests. We sh I mean, they're good in the bad times and they're good in the good times. They're good. But having said that, I wanted this executive team up here because we have to remember that one incident 
one person does not represent 5,200 sworn members in terms of what we're talking about. And I think, quite frankly, uh, if Joe had to do, Joe Gamaldi had to do a retake and maybe uh, uh, on some of the things that he said that night or I don't know what he said since, but right now it's important for people to know I lead the department. Let me finish. This is my, this is my press conference and we'll talk later. That's the one thing I want to get out there right off the bat. Secondly, uh, these men and women here work tirelessly uh, leading the folks that we lead and quite frankly our men and women work tirelessly uh, building the relationship that we've built and so I would urge people to do two things number one we should not paint activists with broad brushes and our department should not be painted with a broad brush because of one guy's comments or whatever comments he's made sense because ultimately that's one person one opinion we should be judged by our body of work as leaders and our body of work as officers and support staff and I think that when you look at the body of work of this police department and you look at it critically you're gonna say it's a good police department so I want to remind the community of the facts that sometimes people don't know what the HPOU is <laughs> and what the HPD is, and sometimes they, they put them two together, uh, their labor, we are the police department. And the police department is 5,200 uh, professionals plus another 1,200 support, and the people that lead them are here. And so uh, I'm going to close with, uh, on that issue, that I've already reached out to my activist community. Actually, they've reached out to us as well. We'll be meeting sometime next week to continue our relationships. Like I've always said, we don't run away from activists. And let's be clear, we want people to c criticize us when it's appropriate, but there's a difference between being an activist and being an anarchist, right? An activist brings to the forefront concerns, uh, scrutinizes a police department, calls out a police department, we support that and, and, and we never back away from that. I've never, I've always run towards activists. But anarchists are those that would say, hey, kill co all cops need to die. Do you understand the difference? And let me just remind people that in our city, we have a tremendous tremendous working relationship with our activists because quite frankly in this city unlike some places we have activists not, not a anarchists and I think that that speaks volumes as to the relationship and the work of the police department. Am I making sense to everybody? So I just wanted to make that distinction uh, and I want to just say that I look forward to actually meeting with our activists because I'll be honest with you guess what anarchists don't meet with the police chief <laughs> they don't the anarchists are throwing bricks and they're uh, burning down cities. That's not what we've. That's not what we had yesterday. That's not what we're going to have tomorrow because not the, that's not the relationship that we have here in the city of Houston. So for the anarchists that might be out there, I'm here to tell you: don't come to this city trying to cause problems because the, what what you're going to meet is not just our police officers saying we're not going to tolerate anarchist behavior. You're going to meet our activists. They're going to say, hey, go, do, go be the fool somewhere else. We're not going to let you mess with our cities. I'm, I'm making sense. Yeah. There's, it's a very distinctive, different, different. So be, and when it comes to HPOU and the police department, we're not one and the same. We have different roles, but we lead the police department. We are the ones that hold people accountable. We are the ones that pick up and help uh, with their help, quite frankly, when our officers need us. Uh, but let's not let's be real clear we have a tr it's no relationships perfect and relationships are work but we have a tremendous history throughout our history and I think if you ask Joe he'll tell you the same thing of working very collaboratively with our uh, activist community and quite frankly we don't really have uh, anarchists here because that's not what Houston Texas is all about this city 
continues to remain one of the most amazing places. I think it's one of the best kept secrets, not too much of a be best kept secret thinking, uh, thanks to the Super Bowl and other incident, uh, other issues. Uh, the reason that we don't have the issues that other cities have had historically is because in the in in in, in the in the last uh, ten years, and I can tell you for certain, the last couple of years. Uh, I can't remember. I think ever since the Super Bowl, we really haven't had any protests against the police department, and we've had officer-involved shootings. Uh, we've actually f had two officers that we got rid of that were charged criminally for uh, officer-involved shootings because we work collaboratively. And I would just hope that our activists, that we all take a step back, take a deep breath. Uh, if you've got an issue with something was said, deal with it directly. But let's put away the broad brushes because we know when we use broad brushes, we end up uh, not building bridges. We end up not building relationships. We end up burning them. So with that, uh, I want to just cha cha uh, cha uh, thank our executive team, uh, our investigators that I'm telling you are working tirelessly. It's going to take several, you know, weeks to get through all the investigation. But I want to close with saying that we, our commitment, as always, is to seek the truth, leave no stone unturned, and to come back and report, just like we do with every investigation when there's an issue, uh, just like we did it with the FBI investigation, as you recall. Uh, that I came back and reported back, and I look forward to uh, the, the conversation. Go ahead. Any questions? I just need you to clarify two things that you've already said. One is this stat that you spitted out, the 1,700 search warrants executed in the last four years. No, that's not right. 1,736. Okay, that's exactly what I said. Um, in that, like, can I add an asterisk to not paint with a broad brush to, to be more accurate? Do they all get executed the same way? Would these seven those are, those, be all uh, undercover? Would the, you have swap back? Like, would there be any reason stop. that one would be more? Uh, you're not listening. You know what I mean? Those are 1,736 search warrants executed by the, the narcotics division. Okay. Okay? They're always executed. 1,736 by the narcotics division. And the way it, uh, the, so, a lot of them will be no knock if appropriate, and some will be different. If I didn't say it was SWAT executing those search warrants, it was the narcotics division search warrants. And they're always undercover. Like yeah, they don't clothes. show they don't show up in uniform, but they do show up with plenty of gear that identifies them as police officers, including patrol officers that are out in front of the house. And again, one of the things that is part of our administrative investigation is what were what, where were the uniformed officers, all the things that go into uh, evaluating uh, the execution of the search warrant. What else? Chief, a couple questions about the warrant. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, can you uh, just outline again the weapon that was uh, uncovered from the home? How many and what was it specifically? The warrant does say that there appeared to have been a nine millimeter gun, at least based on the observation of the CI who was who made the purchase mm -hmm. of the heroin. Uh, the the second question. I don't have the list of firearms. I already released that the night of the incident. Okay. Or the next morning, I think it was. That's, I don't have it with me in front of me. Well, hey, it is what it is. I, I, I already gave you what I have, so I don't know if I had a 9 millimeter, and, uh, you know, I, I don't remember the sure. list. Will we know that for sure, though, down the line? Any confirmation as to what that may be? But these are just questions that folks have reached out to. Yeah, I mean, hey, look, guys, let me just say this. We put out what we know when we know it. Sure. Uh, and unlike other police departments, I actually put out what I know when I know it. If something comes up that changes, we'll let you know. But I've already given you I don't have it with me. I apologize. Okay, so, so you might want to look at, uh, I think we put that on Tuesday morning at the hospital. You did. I, yeah. That's where I got the initial. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. That that that, that, that we put that out the hospital. But then again, remember you're dealing with the CI. Right. So, you know, uh, what might be a nine millimeter might end up being a piss. I, who who knows? Well, that's part of our investigation. Chief, what else? Can you uh, expand a little bit on this one officer involved shooting that you mentioned among the? Uh, uh, no, we're not here to talk about that officer involved shooting, and we're not going to reinvestigate it. Are you talking about the one out of all those? Yeah, I no. Curious if you could. I'm not. I, I'm not going to prepare to talk about. Can you talk, or I don't know if you know yet why um, they chose an afternoon time to, to go in. Mm, and why I, I don't. Was. That's part of the investigation. Remember, you have to remember that uh, we've got uh, we, we've got the case agent that just went from critical to. Uh, to fair conditions, so that'll be part of the investigation. That, that, again, listen, officers, when they execute search warrants or when they're doing police work, are making split-second decisions in many cases, and then we spend weeks, if not months, if not years, 
scrutinizing every piece of that. I don't think there are uh, too many professions, I can't think of any profession that is scrutinized uh, more than Media. more than the law enforcement uh, profession. So, no, I don't have that yet, but uh, we always look at that. So, yes, sir. Actually, there's been some talk about why, why no body cameras. Is it standard policy in a way like this to not wear the body Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Now, let, let's remember this about uh, body-worn cameras. I think people are forgetting that body-worn cameras are still a pretty uh, new technology. Uh, I think because when they were starting to come to the forefront, we had issues like Ferguson. We had a really... Uh, some incidents that really led up to a lot of really bad outcomes in terms of community policing relations. And I used to say it at the time in, in Austin, there was a rush by a lot of departments to, uh, to go out and purchase body-worn cameras. I've been reading reports lately that some departments are actually starting to get rid of their programs. I don't know if you've seen those media reports. We actually, about five weeks ago, at executive staff, uh, and, and it's a resource issue for us, right? We've been deploying them. Uh, over the last uh, two and a half, three years, we've been deploying them. For us, our priority, think about it, one th let, let, me, let me just make sure that we understand what our priority was. Uh, 1,736 warrants were executed by the Narcotics Division since uh, 1 1 of 14 and one officer involved shooting. So, our priority to, was to get, our priority has been to get body worn cameras into the hands of the people that are most prone and most likely to be involved in an, a use of force or response to resistance incident, whether it's, uh, or a complaint, which includes rudeness or, you know, uh, you know, punching, teasing, whatever. And let's face it, the majority of the incidents involve patrol. So that's been our priority. About five weeks ago, I directed uh, Dr. Poor, Diane Poor, uh, who's uh, in our research and plan division, to start looking, because now we're looking at what's the next iteration of our program, where do we go from here? And I'll be honest with you guys, uh, because I've already told my team, when we are going into somebody's home, uh, the likelihood that we won't land on we're going to have body-worn cameras is pretty slim for search warrants. I mean, it is what it is. Because most of the times, we're going to be doing the right things, and we want to capture that. We want to capture what we did, so this conspiracy theorists that some of them that still think the earth is flat or don't believe that uh, some hijackers came in from the Middle East and actually the government blew up the World Trade Center. I can't control those people. But uh, we're probably going to land there, but I'm not going to say that 100% until we finish our, uh, our research. And understand something else on the national level. I don't know if you guys remember, but I'm now the new president of the Major State Chiefs Association, which represents the 69 largest police departments in the country. On the national level, we started the conversation that once we make a decision, the departments to make a decision to go with body-worn cameras on entries, and now they're part of a federal task force, and the federal government agencies don't wear body-worn cameras, what does that do? What does that, what, what does that, what impact will that have on our participation? Not necessarily in um, the task forces, but in our participation in a joint uh, agency uh, search warrant where you might have different members of different organizations in a stack that train together because they're a task force. So that conversation for us to take to, uh, for the fur further development of our program, uh, began about five weeks ago, the research, and uh, we will probably have more information, I would say, on that probably in the next four to four to eight weeks and uh, with the final decision uh, probably within the next eight weeks on where we're headed. I have a meeting of the Major State Chiefs, my very first one as the president in February, joint meeting with the major county sheriffs where we will be having that conversation because I also want to see from the rest of the top leadership of law enforcement in the United States, uh, what their perspectives are. But at the end of the day, we're going to do what we think is right for our city here in Houston. Really quick, on the, on the heroin, right? I know that you talked about the activists and heroin wasn't found or nothing tested positive for it. Uh, excuse me, wh wh what are you talking about? I'm talking about when you all, there, you all found marijuana and you found cocaine, mm -hmm. but you all did not find heroin. Yeah. You all searched after the shooting. But the interesting thing is, and I don't, and I'm talking about it from an investigative standpoint, when you all got the search warrant, it said, listen, we don't want to do, we want to serve this no knock because there's a chance that they could get rid of it. And then I went back and listened to what you said outside Memorial Hermann on Monday. And you said, dude, this guy started shooting. At what point he retreated and then he came back to shoot. So I would imagine there is the likelihood that if there was heroin in the house, 
there's a chance it could have been um, removed or kind of, I don't know, hidden. Is there a way for you all to figure that out in any, like the piping or the any, anything? No, we're not, look, let me, let me, let me just say, let's, let's just say something real clear. Our number one, when it comes to, our number one uh, re responsibility is lives have been taken and uh, an individual in the, tried to take the lives of police officers is to find out what happened in that exchange of gunfire. We're not going to go tear down. Uh, first of all, I don't think a court's going to let you tear up uh, pipes and stuff to go find out. There's, you know, again, I don't know what shows you've been watching. That's not how police work works. Uh, just like some guy was saying, uh, trying to that that the use the justification of use of force was, should be determined based on whether they had a ton of cocaine or no marijuana. They could have had. They could have had, in an incident where we used deadly force, you could have a warehouse full of cocaine or heroin, and still the deadly force is not objectively reasonable, the use of deadly force. Or the flip side of that, you can have a warehouse or a house with no drugs, and the use of deadly force is completely justified. The use of deadly force has nothing to do with the presence or lack of presence. The use of deadly force has nothing to do with the presence of a criminal history or lack of thereof. The use of deadly force or any level of force response to resistance is determined based on the reasonableness of the use of the force. So people can debate that stuff. We're going we're gonna to stick to what we are supposed to be reviewing and going back to. Chief, Chief just one thing about, the, I wanted to ask a question about the comments. It's, after his initial comments, I think a lot of news entities did interviews Following day, and you know he's been on, on cable television as well. He's not backed away from any of statements. If anything, he's doubled, if not tripled down his statements. Um, I think most people see that this was a narcotics case and not anything involving activists or or in this case. Do, do you? Yeah, I mean, have you talked to him? Uh, briefly, look, we, 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 we yeah, we, 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 we let me let me look. Let me just. I'm not. Joe Gamaldi needs to speak for himself. I'm not going to speak for Joe Gamaldi, but let's just be real clear. Uh, I'm not sure that the Tuttles woke up that morning and said, hey, we're going to wait for the cops to come here that says shoot cops, okay? I, I, so I'm not sure what rhetoric had to do with that, okay? It's a tragic situation where four of my officers have been shot, one has been injured, and I want to focus on how did we have four officers shot and one injured, and how did we end up with a shootout with an individual? That's what we need to focus on. And like I told, uh, a family member of the uh, of of the Tuttle, uh, Mr. Tuttle's. You, you, we try to explain human nature. Like I said, keep an open mind because uh, you know the, the again the individual that killed Dr. Ho House Connect not only killed him but stalked him, meticulously planned a homicide. Had no criminal history to my recollection. Had actually worked as a constable, a sworn member of the police. And this guy ended up, you know what happened there. So we're going to focus on getting to a three, but I can just say without a doubt that rhetoric or lack thereof had nothing to do with this case, as far as I can tell. <laughs> At, let me finish. I'm not, you asked me a question, and you let me finish without interrupting. Uh, I can say that the, the actions of anarchists, because you know what? Joe is right when it comes to anarchists to go around saying that cops should die around the country. That does, by and large doesn't happen here. Uh, you kind of went off the other day, but, and I, I'm not going to say who you are. Again, we'll talk later. I know, you can do it later. But, but you know what? My focus that night was on four officers that lay in the hospital, two that we weren't even sure we were going to make it, that we were worried about. And I said it then, and I'm going to say it today again. This city is a special city. This department is a special re department. We enjoy a really positive re relationship with the, 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 with the entire community. North, south, east, west, rich, poor, black, white, brown, immigrant, documented, undocumented, that's what we're about. And I just hope that people, again, not brush, uh, paint a real broad brush over the entire body of work of the police department based on the comments of one person. But I will say, because I've said it before, when in Austin, they brought up, I had a press conference with Black Lives Matter that was in my office, and you guys can look find this. 
and uh, people were angry because I had Black Lives Matter after we shot and killed a 17-year-old African-American young man, totally naked in broad daylight. And uh, they asked me about, hey, what are you doing with Black Lives Matter? Are there segments of any group, including the police, that are good and there's segments that are bad? Are there some bad in everything? Are there people going around in different movements saying, uh, oink, oink, pigs must die? Absolutely. But let's talk about that segment and not people that actually want to work on police accountability. Because I've got friends that are actually relatives of police officers that work as activists. That in their heart, not only do they believe that the majority of cops are good cops, they believe that their own family members that are police officers are best served when they work with us to make sure we weed out bad officers. Am I making sense to you all? And so, but, but it's important, it's a two-way street. I don't want to ever, as a police department, paint anybody with a broad brush based on the actions of one or a group of individuals. We need to judge people individually based on their, am I making sense? So I'm just asking everyone here, let's tone it down, and I've asked him that too, and let's focus on the good, and when we fall short, let's work, focus on holding people accountable, including the community, you know, it's a, it's a mutual responsibility, right? Accountability is not a one-way street. Uh, and let's not erase years of hard work, <laughs> right, over one person. Mm who I haven't, and I'll, I'll tell you, don't ask me what he's been saying on the media, uh, other than that night that I was there, that I, if you look at this guy's reaction closely, uh, hmm. he shouldn't play poker. Uh, this man, I was doing this because I came this close to yanking him off there because uh, it, it took us all by surprise, okay? It was, uh, it was over the top, and, uh, and, and, I'm, and, and you know, from, in one sense, I, I, I get it, but that was not the place. This was not the incident. This had nothing to do with any of the stuff that he was talking about. Okay, so enough said on that. Any other questions? Because I need to get question going. Cargo, Wait a minute, because I got Spanish. Okay, all right, so just real quick, you yeah. specify that the CI purchased the heroin from a man. There's a description of his height and his age. Do you know if that man is Dennis Tuttle or was Dennis Tuttle? Uh, we, have a, we have definitely, a, I mean, it, it does match in terms of an you know, older white man, right? Uh, we have, that's part of our investigation. So, uh, but it's the right house, right? And that will be part of our investigation. We will, uh, by actually direct our team, we're going to be doing a six pack, and uh, we, we, I mean, we'll be doing identification with our with our CI. We'll just take it from there, and we'll come back again. We're not going to. Uh, I'm not going to investigate this in the public. I'm not going to come here every other day, <laughs> telling you, "Hey, we did this today." This is where we're at, and now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to what we do best which is serve with respect, which is serve with transparency. We serve with uh, a community that, res that trust us. We're gonna go back and just uh, work to remind our activists uh, that we, we've done a lot of good work and we need to keep moving forward. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully Joe and the HPOU, who if you, th you know they've done a lot of good work over the years, that they'll go back and, uh, and remind the people of Houston and work on that relationship. But that's their job, it's not my job. I'm worried though that they shot some damage. Uh, you know what? Just uh, you, when, when you when, look, I have for any time that you get that emotional when you let your emotions get the best of you. I've done it. I've said things at press conferences that I've that I've regretted because in the heat of the moment you say stuff. But uh, I can tell you we've got a lot of phone calls from through, from the community. Uh, I've, I've gotten phone calls, and it's not, uh, I've gotten news for anybody that thinks that it does, has not harmed us. Regardless of intent, the impact has had a damaging, uh, has impacted the, the standing of the police department. But what's important, and when we go back out, HPOU is not 5,200 cops. HPOU is not the HPD, and HPOU doesn't lead the police department, isn't responsible for the uh, overall and day-to-day -day operations of the police department. And some men and women you see here, the 44 commanders, the lieutenants, the sergeants, and ultimately the officers. And, and, and lastly, uh, one incident, uh, one person does not represent the collective opinions, hearts, or minds of the Houston Police Department. I will close with saying uh, and I'm going to go to Spanish. I'm done in English. 
Uh, I'm going to close with saying, like I said before, uh, I said it Monday night, the love affair of this police department between this police department, between 5,200 sworn and 1,200 support staff members, a police department that is reflective of the most diverse community in the United States, a police department that is the minority majority in terms of its makeup, like the community that we serve. As a matter of fact, my recollection is out of the narcotics agents that all were involved in this operation Monday, they were all either black or brown, <coughs> including the two African American officers that, are, uh, that were critically uh, injured. Uh, with the exception, the only one I can remember that wasn't black or brown was uh, a sergeant that, uh, that uh, had to get knee surgery. I, we are the community and the community is us. Sir Robert Peel said that uh, over a century ago, uh, and no truer <coughs> words have ever been spoken. And I think when you look at the history of the Houston Police Department, the modern history, because there's some ugly history here too, like there is in policing, uh, I don't think that no police department and no community reflects the words of Sir Robert Peel more than the Houston Police Department and the people of Houston. So to the community, thank you for the continued prayers. Uh, we ask that you continue to work with us, to our activists. Uh, uh, I've, I've got to be in D.C. I've been summoned to talk about, I've actually talked to Senator Cornyn, uh, I've talked to Sheila Jackson Lee and other members of uh, the Congress to talk about uh, gun policy on how we can uh, reduce you know, gun violence in our community. Uh, so I probably will have that, I hope to have that meeting uh, on Thursday, uh, but if it needs to be sooner, you know, I've got an entire team that can meet, but I definitely want to be in that meeting. I hope to have it uh, sometime Thursday.